Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. Oh, I'm going to have to turn this the fuck down. Oh, jeez. It's up at like 100. All right. That's better. Hi. Hi. Okay. That doesn't blow my ears off anymore. <laughs> Big Yanklevich coming at you uh, semi-live, not quite live, from the freeways of East Texas. Uh, I'm on my way to work again, and uh, that means it's time to record myself a new ankle cast. So, today I'm going to talk about something. Oh, if I don't crash. Today... <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about something that has become uh, very important to me recently. Uh, I mentioned in previous shows that I was going to make this a big production, that I was going to like write it all out and then perform it, make like a video essay out of it like Rish did with his character assassination Skywalker thing, if you ever saw that. Um, but then, and I wrote like five pages worth of it so I could have done it but then uh, I don't know something in me changed the other day and I decided that I didn't want to do it that way I just wanted to talk about it um, and uh, maybe it's because I'm, I'm a little less sure about it right now than I have been but anyways uh, I, I made a post on Facebook the other day talking about how I'd, I'd reached a certain level in my weight loss goals. And I got lots of thumbs up and way to go and you go girl and all that kind of stuff. Um, which is nice. It makes me feel good. It makes me uh, want to keep at it. But um, uh, I, I was already really pretty gung-ho about it before that. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on my situation. When I was a kid, I was an active kid. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. Um, we were all active kids. Uh, there was video games. You know, they were new. They were basic. And we played them like crazy, but we still, we weren't, uh, I don't know, it, it wasn't as much of a thing. You couldn't play a video game forever like you can now. It wasn't 40 hours worth of content in a video game. There was, you know, just a game that you played over and over again. It was about often the uh, same complexity as, like, tic-tac-toe or something. So, you know, we played it. I did Pitfall Harry jumping over the, uh, you know, landing on the alligators and jumping over the pits. But... I mostly played outside, played with my friends, played with toys, rode bikes, played sports, things like that. I was active. And, um, and I, I, I was that way through my whole uh, youth. All the way up through high school, I played on the high school football team. And I, was, um, I, was, I did a lot of weightlifting because of that too. And I was always just a, a very active dude. And uh, then I got married and I became less active. You know, when you become an adult, you seem to become less active for some reason. I stopped doing a lot of the things that I could have done. And on top of that, then I had a wife who cooked well. She made tasty things. Um, and so I ate well for several years. And I would say within the first five years of being married, I packed on a lot of pounds. Um, it wasn't long after uh, first getting married that I was to the point where I needed to start losing some weight. Um, now, if you know... Uh, what was the standard wisdom of the time, the food pyramid, uh, that, 
that's what I based my efforts off of. You know, six to 11 servings of breads and cereals, three to five servings of vegetables, two to four servings of fruits, uh, two to four servings of meat and dairy, and, you know, fats and sugars used sparingly. That's what I always tried to do, you know, I would, I would bring a lunch to work, I would you know, put a lot of vegetables in there, and I would always make sure I had my breads, I'd have like a sandwich or something like that. You know, I would do stuff to try and uh, get myself in shape. And I walked on my lunch break to try and improve my activity level too. It didn't really do me a lot of good and I didn't stick with it for very long ever either. Um, it was hard to stick with. Uh, you, you would get hungry all the time if you were really watching your calories and stuff like that. Um, it was really difficult. And uh, I would always fall back and I would, you know, be back eating cookies and ice cream and chocolate and all the things that I like the most, along with some fatty things as well. Oh, donuts, there's another one of my uh, Achilles heels. Um, and yeah, I just kept going up. Uh, I was proud of myself for a long time because I never made it to 300 pounds. Um, but there came a time when I couldn't be proud of that anymore either because I passed that up. Uh, there were times, and, and I've talked about it on the show because it happened while the show was going, but I lost some more weight. I got, uh, I, I did this thing called HCG. I don't know what that stands for, but it's some kind of hormone or something like that that women have when they're pregnant that I, I don't know exactly what it was even supposed to do to tell you the truth. Um, supposed to help with your appetite or something like that. So you'd take this HCG and then you would eat hardly anything. I mean, seriously, I was eating like 700 calories a day. Um, and I lost weight, yeah, I really did. And it was surprisingly enough, that's what happens when you don't eat anything. Um, but, wasn't long after I was off that I started gaining that weight back and so I didn't you know HCG again and then I lost weight and then uh, I started gaining it back I tried all, all sorts of things I was doing running long distance running there was a, I ran a, a half marathon uh, several years ago and truthfully I love running and I'd like to get back to it right now my legs and back do not agree with that idea and so I don't do any running I do walk some but running uh, my my body says, yeah, maybe you better uh, get us in line first before you try doing that again. So we'll have to see if I can ever make that happen. Um, but every time that I would lose weight, it would come back. Uh, eventually it came all the way back. You know, and, and I would, what would you call it? I would just get into like a, a state of mind, like a fever or something where I just didn't give a shit anymore and I would eat the worst stuff. I would drink like five sodas a day um, and it was like I was really trying hard to put that weight back on. And for all I know, that's probably what was going on in my mind. My body saying, hey, we're not where we're supposed to be. We need to add that weight back on. Hurry, eat, eat, eat. Um, so I eventually got to that point where I was, I got to 300 pounds and left it behind. I didn't leave it far behind. I think the most I ever got to really was 307. Um, when I was 307, right around New Year's of 2016, I suddenly started losing weight. And I wasn't really trying to lose weight, which uh, in fact, to tell you the truth, I was probably trying to gain it still because I was drinking Code Red like it was water. Like it was, I don't know, like more than like it was water. Uh, I was just chugging that stuff. I'd go through like several 
20 ounce bottles, like three or four or five of them a day, just drinking just a crap ton of soda, and I would eat anything that I wanted. I kept losing weight. Um, and that's not a good thing. It sounds like a good thing, but it's not because it's gotten kind of dark out here. I'm gonna take the glasses off. It's not because that means something's wrong. You don't lose weight without trying, unless something really bad is going on. Sometimes that means cancer uh, or other diseases like that. In my case, it turned out to be diabetes. I was in what they call ketoacidosis, in which my body was just fucked up. <laughs> and I was uh, converting all my fat into... Uh, into food and then my body didn't even use it because it was so foobar in the uh, area of insulin resistance that it you know I just it just kept converting that fat to try and make it into energy and then I would just pee it out because um, yeah I wasn't I wasn't able to even use it my body was so foobar so I went to the doctor got the diagnosis and became a diabetic and they tried to basically get me back on the, the food pyramid more or less I mean it was that's what they advised is that I start eating you know this many carbohydrates this much vegetables and fruits uh, they I think they probably had some good advice as well but I as soon as I found out I was a diabetic I stopped eating sugar in any way um, I did still have other carbohydrates which uh, I probably shouldn't have because those just turn right into sugar once you eat them like potato chips I was eating potato chips because I couldn't have sugar which just tells you how kind of foobar my mentality was still um, but by doing that I lost uh, I, my, my blood sugar got under control and uh, I was doing okay for a while and, and then I I started to learn a little bit more about what it means to be diabetic I, I, there was a friend of ours whose wife was diabetic I discovered and I talked with him about that one time when we went out we were hanging out with him at a restaurant and then afterwards everybody's like oh let's go to this place here it's a cookie shop I think it was called Smart Cookie or something like that. And, yeah, they had all different kinds of cookies. And I <laughs> used to love that place. I love chocolate chip cookies. They're one of my biggest vices. And Rish can probably tell you because I think one time he tried to slash my throat when I suggested that we get a cookie when we were hanging out together um, on our old Doonstief nights. Luckily, I was able to get my hand up just in time to block it. So he only slashed the back of my hand, but um, yeah, he, he, I think he grew very tired of me suggesting that we get cookies. Uh, but we went to this place because everybody decided they wanted to, and, and for once I wasn't pleased to go to this place because I couldn't have a cookie anymore. And this diabetic chick's like, oh, she gets herself one, and she sits there and eats it um, while... I'm sitting there going, no, I'm not going to have anything because I can't. And just sitting there watching everybody eat their cookies and just hating my fucking life. And thinking, how does this diabetic person eating this sugary thing when I can't? And I came to discover that, yeah, it's not a, it's, it's a thing that, you know, even the, the I went and saw the nutritionist, and the nutritionist said, "Oh yeah, you got to give yourself a treat every now and then. You know, you can't be too hardcore because you know you're you're gonna lose it." Which I suppose in the end I did. I, I but it was a gradual thing. I gave myself a treat now and then, and then I gave myself more treats more often and more treats more often and pretty soon I was eating as bad as before I was a diabetic and my A1C which is a test they do on your blood cells or something like that which it's something that basically I 
think it's your blood cells, they have something on them which basically can tell you how much blood sugar they've been dealing with over the last three months. So you can't, you can't fake it, you can't hide it. You can't just eat good right before you go to the doctor and, you know, do your blood sugar and see, oh yeah, it's normal, and then go right to the Baskin Robbins on the way home. Because, um, you know, the doctor's gonna know, you know, it's three months worth. My A1C, when I wasn't eating sugar, came down so far that it was almost a normal A1C, a, a non-diabetic one. And then it went back up and it got up higher. And then I moved to Texas and I didn't have a doctor for a long time. I, I should have got, gone to see the doctor. I think you're supposed to see him every three months when you're a diabetic. And I went almost a whole year without seeing a doctor. And I kept thinking, man, I gotta stop doing this. And I was still eating poorly and I just thought, shit, man, I'm killing myself. Every time I eat this sugar, I'm making things worse. I'm gonna have to have my feet amputated. I'm destroying myself doing this. And then one day, by chance, and I'm not exactly sure what caused this, how, maybe it's because I'd seen other TED Talks. Uh, and so there was a suggestion on my YouTube saying, well, you like these other TED Talks, what about this one? And it was a TED Talk about diabetes. And I thought, oh, well, shoot, I'll check this out. It was by somebody named Sarah Hallberg, I think her name is. And she had a totally different idea for me. Um, she started telling me about something called high fat, low carbohydrate, low carbohydrate diet. If we take the carbs out, what are we going to put in? Because remember, there's only three macronutrients. If one goes down, one has to go up. My patients eat fat and a lot of it. In which people eat fat and don't eat carbs because basically when you're diabetic, you are carb intolerant. Um, you're allergic to carbohydrates. You are, there's gotta be a better word for it than that. At its root, diabetes is a state of carbohydrate toxicity. But anyways, your body doesn't know what to do with carbohydrates. It's screwed up and it's got its hormones all out of whack and carbohydrates are the reason why its hormones are out of whack, because you've been having too many of them. And carbohydrates stimulate insulin, and you uh, can only have so much insulin before your body starts going, whoa, that's too much. And, and basically, like, if someone's yelling, or no, no, we'll say you go to a place where there's a jackhammer nearby, and you first get there and, oh, fuck, that is so loud, it's driving you crazy, and you can't stand it. But then you've been there for half an hour, and you're almost to the point where you barely notice the jackhammer. Well, your body does that with all sorts of things, as you've probably noticed. Like, somebody farts, and it stinks in the room at first, and then, after a while, you don't smell it. But then somebody else walks in, and they're like, oh, my God, what have you guys been doing in here? It stinks! You're just like, huh, I don't even smell it anymore. Same thing happens with insulin. Your body uh, has these little insulin receptors on its cells and pretty soon it starts to down regulate those things to where uh, it's, it's basically ignoring the insulin that comes. And pretty soon uh, you're full of insulin, but your body doesn't even know it's there so it doesn't function correctly anymore and you're a diabetic. And uh, basically, insulin comes around, it gets high like that because of carbohydrates. That's, it's telling your body to store carbohydrates. And the way to overcome that is to stop eating carbohydrates. At least, that's what this woman said. Insulin resistance is essentially a state of carbohydrate intolerance. So why, oh why, do we want to continue to recommend to people to eat them? And I was interested because I realized how much I was killing myself. Uh, you know, I've, I've, ever since I became diabetic, I kind of had that, that mindset of, you know, my time is, is short. You know, I'm 40 years old, 
40-ish, anyways. I was 40 a few years ago. Now I guess I'm, what, 43? Uh, but anyways, I'm in my 40s, we'll say, which for most people you'd say, okay, that's, that's right about halfway, you know? Um, life expectancy is somewhere around 80, so you're probably about halfway through your life. Oh, here's the traffic. I guess that'll give me more time to talk about this BS. <laughs> but anyways, you know, you're, you're, you're right around halfway, and I used to think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the halfway mark in my life, which is kind of weird to think, because my life feels like it was really long already. So when I think about that, I got that much more to go. Well, that's good, but then when I became diabetic, and I started learning about how the average diabetic shortens their life expectancy by about 20 years. And I became very, uh, the word won't come to me, probably because of type three diabetes, which they call Alzheimer's. Um, pessimistic, I became very pessimistic. My outlook on life was poor. I just thought, you know, I got maybe 20 years left and uh, there will probably come a day when i got to have a foot amputated or I have a stroke or one of the other many things that uh, I am at a much higher probability to get now that I'm diabetic. And my outlook was really grim. Um, that's changed, by the way. That's a spoiler for you. Sorry. But I'll, I'll talk about it later. I'm, sh I'm hoping. I'll remember to anyways. Um, but yeah, I saw this and she was talking about patients uh, that she had who would eat this way and all of a sudden they were able to take diabetes off their list of conditions that they have. You know, they can't, you know, she says. One of the greatest joys of my job is to be able to tell a patient like this that they no longer have diabetes and we ceremoniously take it off their problem list together. So, are they cured? Is this a miracle? We'll leave that grandstanding to Dr. Oz. Cured would imply that it can't come back. And if they start eating excessive carbs again, it will. So no, not cured, but they don't have diabetes any longer. It's resolved. And it can stay that way as long as we keep away the cause. Of course, if you start eating sugar again, I'm sure it'll just send you right back down that road. But uh, high fat, low carbohydrate was her Suggestion. So I started looking into this. Um, and this is what I've learned through my, uh, my investigations. I've watched dozens upon dozens upon dozens of YouTube videos, which I really like because I can just put them on in a browser. And most, a, a ton of YouTube videos are just people talking. And the visuals to them are incidental most of the time. A lot of times it's like this show. I just got a fucking camera shoot me while I drive my car and talk. Is that an awesome video? No, but some people still watch it. One or two anyways. Most of you guys probably just listen and don't even know that I make videos out of these. Um, but the good thing is sometimes I'll throw up a picture or something like that that has to do with what I'm talking about. Uh, so there's that slight uh, addition, slight advantage to watching. Um, and you can see what my face looks like, which uh, some people think that's interesting. I, or other people hate it. Like they, they real, they've been listening to me all these years. They've got this mental image of what I look like and then they see what I really look like and they're like, fuck, that's not right. And they don't want to ever see it again because it has ruined things. Um, but anyways, I really like listening to YouTube videos because of that, because they're, you know, they're basically podcasts, and I can just throw them on in a browser and then just, you know, do my work at work while I listen to videos, and then every now and then I might have to pause it so that I can do something that requires the sound, but most of the time, it doesn't matter. 
That wasn't a real fart, by the way, in case you were wondering. That was me mouth noising. <laughs> I did that the other day at work. Somebody was saying something, and I went, yeah, whatever. And they thought I just totally farted. I was like, no, dude, that was my, I was, I was demonstrating my opinion of what you were saying by making that noise. I believe they call that blowing a raspberry. Uh, or blowing... No, I won't go there. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so yeah, I watched a lot of YouTube videos, back to the subject. And I've learned a lot about how this low-carb, high-fat diet thing works. Um, and there's a few different uh, mindsets on it. The one that I most looked into is called the ketogenic diet. Not to be confused with ketoacidosis, there is something called ketosis, uh, which is basically a state of uh, using fat to supply yourself with energy. Uh, when you get carbohydrates, you break the carbohydrates down into glucose, and you can use the glucose to power your body. Or, if you don't have glucose, you can break your fat down or fat that you eat down into ketone bodies and use those to power your body with. And so they call it ketosis. A lot of people also call this starvation mode, which I guess uh, you could call it that because when you are starving, you would be basically cannibalizing your own body for food until you just can't anymore. But a lot of us have a, a whole bunch of body to be cannibalized. You know, uh, I heard somebody describe it. I can't remember who it was, but he was saying, you know, we've got these, these just massive reservoirs of energy. Just, you know, we're like, we're like somebody who's been saving up money forever in this big bank vault. Uh, or to make the metaphor really work, we were saving it in this giant piggy bank, right? And then something happened and we lost the key to this piggy bank. And we can't use the money that's in the piggy bank. Instead, we just have to carry the damn piggy bank around all the time. So it's nothing but just a disaster for us. Uh, and that's what people that are fat like me are basically I've got this piggy bank full of money and I wear it around with me everywhere I go and you know I'm, I've got riches uh, I've heard a story about a guy who was like I don't know 400 pounds he was really big anyways we'll put it at that and he got together with a doctor and came up with this plan to fast and he fasted for like 300 some odd days. I think it was more than a year that he went without food. He had water and I think he had like coffee and tea or something like that. He had mineral supplements and things like that, but he didn't eat for a year and he survived just fine and actually had no like long-term uh, health problems because of it. The, in fact, he lived until he was in his 80s, which he probably wouldn't have done if he was still 400 pounds like he was before. Um, he was able to do that because he had a giant bank strapped to his belly and the rest of his body. His body uses fat to ward off starvation if there's a problem. It's something that we've evolved to do over hundreds of thousands of years because, you know, up until, I don't know, probably the last 50 years, there was still a good chance that food was going to become really scarce. Recently, we've been living in a, you can't really say it's a post-scarcity world. We haven't quite made it to that. But we're nigh on post-scarcity. There is food everywhere. There's no worries about it. At least in the first world, maybe in some places, I don't know, Venezuela. If you live in a communist country, you can find yourself uh, having to go through the Maduro diet, as they like to call it. People are losing weight there a lot because there's no food to eat because of communism. Um, and it's utter lack of ability to keep people 
uh, fed. But uh, in the first world, we don't have that problem. We have too much, really. That's the problem that we have. We have this ability to just, we never have to stop eating because there is no reason to. There's more food and it's cheap. You could just go buy more Oreos or whatever. Um, so basically the low carb, high fat thing wants to take advantage of this state of ketosis. The ketogenic diet is what I started um, I started trying to do it back in December and I took it slow because I, I was still learning about it and I wasn't sure exactly how to go about it. Um, what it says to do is basically you're turning the food pyramid on its head more or less. You're taking the fats and making them the basis of your diet the way you want to break things up. If you know what a macronutrient is, there's three macronutrients and all foods fall into this category. There's either carbohydrates or fats or proteins. And that's your three uh, macronutrients. And what it tells you to do is that you need to take your carbohydrates and make them the least used macronutrient. They want you to get down to 20 grams net of carbohydrates. And a net means you take your carbohydrates and then you subtract the fiber in your carbohydrates out. And that's your net. So if you eat 40 carbohydrates or 40 grams of carbohydrates, but there's 20 grams of fiber in it, then you're just right. Um, so they want you to do that with your carbohydrates about 35% that, so that would be probably 5% of your what you eat. 35% is your proteins. So it's, just, it's, it's moderate protein, they always say. It's not high protein like an Atkins diet. It's a moderate protein. So basically you're f supposed to be fending off any kind of muscle loss that you would get if you didn't have enough protein to feed your muscles with. And then lastly, you go at about 60% of what you eat is fats. Um, now that might sound like a lot, but it's actually less than you think because fats have more calories in them than uh, any other. Carbohydrates and proteins have the same amount of calories in them per gram or how, however you're weighing it. Whereas fats have almost twice as much uh, calories. So you can't eat as much fat. But the funny thing about fat is, and a lot of people talked about this and I have experienced it for myself since I started trying to do it, fat is unbelievably filling. You eat fat and you don't have to eat a lot and you are full. Just as an experiment, go get some of that like heavy whipping cream from the store and drink like a cup of it. Um, I think you'll find that it's going to go a million miles farther to fill you up than a cup of milk. A cup of skim milk, we'll say, <laughs> that has little to no fat in it versus this cup of cream, which is almost all fat. Uh, yeah, fat fills you up and boy howdy, then some does it. Um, so you really can't eat as much fat as you can other things. That was one of the things that they talked about in one of the videos that I watched. They did a study on fats um, uh, being eaten by people versus carbohydrates and they tried to overfeed people on carbohydrates and they tried to overfeed people with fats. And they found that people just couldn't eat too much fat. So it took a heroic effort for someone to eat a lot of fat. You could eat, uh, you know, eating a stick of butter, a whole stick of butter, people just couldn't do it. They would start, you know, doing it for science. 
they would start into it and they couldn't finish, you know, they couldn't do it. Whereas, you know, you gave somebody a shit ton of potato chips or candy bars or something like that, and they could. They, sometimes you do reach a point, you know, if, if with plain old carbohydrates especially, you can really do it. If you add the sugar into it, you'll reach a level where you're just, uh, you know, overwhelmed. You're just sick to your stomach by the a massive amounts of sweetness that you have ingested. And I'm sure, you know, all of us have been kids, so we all remember what that's like. And many of us, like me, uh, still remembers what it's like because I, you know, did it last, you know, earlier this year. Just, well, not this year, sorry. Back in 2017. Um, so, anyways, yeah, fat is really feeling, so it's hard to eat too much on it. And when you eat a meal that has a lot of fat in it, you're full. And you don't feel the need to eat in between. Um, so I started doing that. Uh... I started doing that in December. I started really working on that. And I, I, it, was a, it was a progressive thing. I got more and more good at it and was able to put more and more things behind me. Um, and not too long ago, I think it was in February, I went to see my diabetes doctor for the first time since I came to Houston, way past the time I should have, as I mentioned before. But I went and saw him, and this was after having done uh, the ketogenic diet for, uh, I'm not saying that I did it perfectly, but I was doing it and doing my best at it for about three months, and I went in there and he took my A1C, which tells you about how you've been uh, doing with blood sugar for three months and the doctor came in and he said what is this that you're talking about with diabetes what diabetes I mean I'm looking at your A1C and I want to say it was a 5.8 something like that and I believe 5.7 is a normal A1C 5.8 is just into diabetes. So basically I was 0.1 away from not being diabetic at all in three months of doing a ketogenic diet. Um, and in those three months I'd also lost eh, maybe 10 pounds. I was probably like 303, 304, I don't know. I'm, I was probably 307 pounds we'll say when I started, although sadly I wish I'd like taken a picture of the scale or something so that I could know exactly where I started at. But I had come down from 307 to probably 295, maybe less, somewhere around there. No, that's not fast weight loss. It's only like 12 pounds in three months. That's not crazy at all take me in my friggin' lifetime to lose all the weight that I need to lose if I lose it that slow, but that might not be a bad idea. Um, so there was that uh, uh, aspect of improvement as well. And also He took my, he took, he did a bunch of tests on me to check my cholesterol. That was one thing I was a little worried about. Check my cholesterol and see if it was high or low, or I assumed, you know, eating a lot of fat, it's supposed to be high, because that's what they've been telling us forever. Uh, you eat fat, you're going to have high cholesterol, and the high cholesterol is going to kill you. Um, my fat, my cholesterol was normal. Uh, a lot of the things had actually improved. Uh, I think it was slightly higher than normal in one of the, I think it's the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol or whatever, although I'm not so sure that they still think that that is a proper term for what LDL is. But um, that one was slightly higher than normal. All the rest had come down. Uh, 
uh, the good cholesterol was up where it should be. Um, my triglycerides were way down, which is also something that's what's really dangerous for heart disease. So, and that was looking good too. Um, so, after several months, that was where I was at. Now, I knew that there was still a lot of things that I needed to improve. If I wanted to lose weight, the key was to get my insulin levels down. Now, he didn't test my insulin levels to tell me where they were at, but I could guess that my insulin levels were still high because insulin reacts to sweetness, basically. You eat something sweet and it tells your brain, here comes sugar, and your brain goes and tells your, uh, your glands, here comes sugar, make insulin, and it makes insulin. Now, if you do diet soda, that's also sweet. And your brain says, here comes sugar, make insulin. And so you do, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't work out because you don't have any, uh, any, anything for the insulin to get. It does, however, keep your insulin levels high and your insulin uh, is what tells your body to not use fat. And so you can't lose fat while you have high insulin levels. So I knew I needed to change that. Um, I'm almost to work though, so I'm going to call this a show, and I'll do another one soon in which I tell the next portion of this story in which I gave up diet soda and some other things that were hindering me and turned things around. So I'll see you guys soon. Uh, thanks for listening or watching, and uh, we'll be back again next time, folks. Thank you. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to a great place. You're off and away. Your goal should be a dream with a deadline. That's why I gave you five years. Do it. Do it. You miss 100% of the shots you never take. Take the shot. There will always be things in the way you dream. Don't let your dreams be dreams. You go out and you find why not. You surround yourself with why not. Live a why not life, man. There are a million no's, but all you need is one yes. Where we are today is where we are. Today's the starting day. I know what we're gonna do today. Just do it! Do it! And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. That's all it takes to be successful is an attitude. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe that you're going to be successful. Nothing is impossible. Dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Bye-bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle! Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye-bye! Oh.